Hello and welcome to another episode of the Bitcoin Standard Podcast. Our guest today is Alex Epstein. Alex's book, The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels, is a great book, which was very influential for me and helped um, really clarify a lot of ideas and thoughts that I had about energy and how uh, the economics of energy works. And this is something that I had uh, you know, studied in my undergraduate as a mechanical engineer. And then in my PhD, I uh, studied all these alternative energy technologies and um, came up with a pretty skeptical uh, viewpoint of them. And it was only until I reread read um, Alex's book that it really clarified for me where the skepticism comes from and what the problem with a lot of these energy sources uh, was. Uh, Alex has founded the Center for Industrial Progress to offer a positive pro-human alternative to the green movement. And he has a, next, a new book coming up in February 20. 22 and it's called fossil future and he also publishes a regular substack newsletter on global energy issues uh, which we will link to in uh, the show notes so alex thank you so much for joining us hey good to be back great having you so um you've been pretty active over the past uh, few weeks and months well years as well but particularly the last few weeks with the uh, COP conference in Glasgow on uh, whatever they're calling it these days, uh, uh, the uh, global climate catastrophe that is supposedly befalling the climate, world. I think climate emergency and climate crisis are the two ter scare terms of the moment. Yeah, I think we're gone past the term global warming because um, I think 1998 was like the warmest year on record and we haven't gotten any warmer than 1998. So the, and we've had a few very, very bad winters. So the term global warming, I think a few uh, PR people must have said that maybe we should uh, move away from this. And climate change also doesn't quite um, communicate the same sense of hysterical urgency that you might want. And so I think now the scientific and by you know, fiat scientific consensus seems to be that it's a climate crisis. Um, and so um, we saw basically all of the world's governments gathered together in the Glasgow, uh, flying thousands of jets uh, with uh, thousands of self-important people to go there and lecture the rest of us peasants on why we should stay cold and immobile and pay much more for all the basics that we need for our survival. Um, you've had some very, very, very uh, strong words for this, and uh, you've called it a genocidal uh, plan and genocidal conference. I agree with you entirely, but can you explain to us why you use the term genocidal? Sure. Just one quick comment about the terminology. So I think it has warmed. I mean, depending on what measurements you look at, it's, it's warmed a little bit since the late 90s. But what, what has been lacking is the kind of exponential warming that would be anticipated uh, because there has been a very rapid increase in fossil fuel use. I mean, even during my lifetime, it's almost, I'm 41 and it's, it's almost doubled during, uh, during my lifetime. And so, yeah, what they did is warming was no longer super scary. So then it was like climate change. And that's an interesting thing because I think it trades on people's view that man-made change is bad, which is something we could talk about. I think that's a really bad bias that we have. But then even that wasn't scaring people enough. So they wanted to build in the negative evaluation without thought. And that's really what climate crisis, climate catastrophe are. Because it's not something you can observe. Like, oh, there's a crisis, there's a catastrophe. But they want you to accept this thing without any thought and without any arguments. I think it's very, very... Um, insidious. And it's particularly insidious because it's not just they want you to be afraid in a vacuum, which would be bad enough, but they want you to do things like what this conference is based on, which is it, it's a fossil fuel elimination conference. They, they call it climate change conference, climate action. All of these are euphemisms, the mechanism of dealing with what they think is the problem. They think the problem is, is rising CO2 levels, is eliminating uh, fossil fuel use. And I think, why do I call it genocidal? This is in the context of People are looking at this conference from two perspectives. One is, well, it might, it might succeed, in which case we're going to get a whole bunch of commitments that people will act on, or it might fail, which is we're not going to get as many commitments as we want. And my view is, no, that's like saying it's a conference to kill the whole world, and we're wondering, like, hey, is it going to succeed or is it going to fail? No, this is an evil conference, because what it's saying is we should eliminate fossil fuel use by the year 2050. So fossil fuel use provides 80% of the world's energy. Uh, so that's all the thing, that's, that's the food that all the machines that produce the value that allow us to live and flourish. That's what fossil fuels do. They provide 80%. 
including in transportation and industry, far higher percentages. So they're totally essential for that. And this is in a world that's massively energy deprived. So one statistic I like that I got from Robert Bryce, a good, really good energy thinker, is there are 3 billion people who use less electricity than a typical American refrigerator. So you think we're in an energy poor world. We have one form of energy that after generations of competition from alternatives is 80% of the energy. And yet we're talking about rapidly eliminating it. And not only that, but we are insisting on only using or almost exclusively using unreliable solar and wind, which are 3% of the world's energy, totally dependent on subsidies and mandates and physically dependent on controllable power sources, mostly fossil fuels, as well as some nuclear and some hydro. So if you look at just, if you recognize energy is crucial to human life, it's, mu it's greatly needed fossil fuels are essential to energy, and we're talking about rapidly eliminating them. That's why I say this is, is genocidal. And the fact that almost nobody has that perspective, like they think I'm crazy, but I think they're crazy. And I think it ultimately comes down to what is our goal morally? And my ultimate goal is advancing human flourishing around the world. And I think if that's your goal, you have to recognize we need a lot more energy, including fossil fuels. But I think the real goal that, and this, I talk a lot about this in Fossil Future, the real goal that's animating this discussion is the goal of eliminating human impact on the planet with the ultimate ideal being an unimpacted earth. And that's really the only reason why the number one specific goal of our society today is eliminating CO2 emissions. And that makes no sense from a human perspective to that have that be the overwhelming moral goal. But if, you're, if your implicit moral goal is eliminating human impact, yeah, then your whole focus is gonna be how do we get rid of CO2 emissions even though, as I believe, and I think I can prove, that would be genocidal. Yeah, uh, I, I agree with you entirely. And I think it's, this, this is really a key point, which is an assumption that goes unquestioned for most people, um, which is that uh, what is it that you're actually optimizing for? Do you want humans to flourish and live good lives? Or are you optimizing for this idea that the earth should be unimpacted by humans, which is... Um, I think a completely insane and unworkable position because if you really believe that that is your end goal, there is no way that you can rationalize not killing yourself. I mean, just kill yourself. Except that you can kill others all along the way. That's really what it amounts to, right? Actually, you're right. I think you're right. Yeah. I think you could That's justify... like Hitler was a hero according to this view. He's also an environmentalist. That's true. Right. I think like, you're like right. He took no, out think... a lot of people. Yeah, I think, yeah, if it, it, you can justify you continuing to make an impact on Earth because you will kill more people. I had not thought of it this way. You know, you could do more, um, you know, you could do more to make Earth unimpacted by killing a billion people than just killing yourself. I had and not thought of it That's the private jet way. argument, right? Yeah, I mean, if you look at, like, what's the private jet argument? So, you know, John Kerry and these, I think it's at least 400 specific private jets flying in. What's the argument? I mean, they say, yeah, we emit a lot but we're gonna stop a lot more by coming here. We're gonna stop a lot more emissions than we cause. So we're gonna be carbon neutral or even carbon negative. Well, if you realize energy is life, that basically means you're just killing a bunch of people or you're causing a bunch of preventable suffering. So yeah. they, that, that's the whole argument for their existence that they're gonna wipe out more life in some form, whether it's like direct lives lost or whether it's people's just ability to live as they choose. They're gonna wipe out a lot more of that than they consume. Now, of course, they live excessively lavish lifestyles for that goal, but at least that goal of wiping out those emissions and ultimately life, that's that's really what logically justifies their existence. Yeah, I must admit, I had not thought of it. This I've, I've argued with a bunch of these people and um, none of them has ever presented to me this argument that, you know, I'm staying alive because it, uh, hopefully I'll be able to reduce more energy. Um, no, they just usually um, get angry when you point so that out. So what do they say? What do they say? A um, bunch of incoherent nonsense about, well, you know, um, that you're being ridiculous and um, so, you know, uh, we can find the right balance uh, between humans living and not impacting the earth. But yeah, it's, uh, most people haven't thought about it, I think. Um, and I haven't thought about it. But yeah, I think, you know, when you think about somebody like Bill Gates, probably. We, well, Bill Gates, I think, is an opportunist who's just in it for the money. I don't think he's... Uh, thought of this um, very profoundly. But I think some of the more ideological, like people like Paul Ehrlich, I think, yeah, they would have that idea. And then, you know, these are people that have been 
talking about depopulating the earth since the 1970s. It's, it's, it's not some crazy conspiracy. They really do view humanity as an illness that needs to be eliminated from the face of the earth. It's funny, you know, just one quick comment on that is, we, you know, when I say the goal is eliminating human impact, you know, that's really what green means. I mean, they'll say it's like to minimize our impact. And people sometimes think, oh, it just means I want clean air and clean water. No, but it's minimizing all human impact. And it's viewing all human impact as, as intrinsically wrong. And you just imagine if somebody said to you, hey, my goal is to eliminate all bear impact from the earth. You're going to think, oh, that person is very anti-bear and their ultimate goal is to kill a whole bunch of, kill all the bears, right? But yet we're told, yeah. oh, eliminate human impact. And we think, oh, that's good. And it's like, no, that's us, right? That's either our, our, our full lives or huge aspects of our lives. It's really this, this, hidden in plain sight anti-human goal of eliminating human impact uh, yeah and earth. i think the the, the from from an economist's perspective you know particularly austrian economists you know uh, they understand economics from a subjective lens where all economic value exists because humans are there to value things right and so um a lot of these people don't come from an austrian economics background and so they can maintain incoherent um, viewpoints where you know we we care about making the earth good and they don't understand that uh, you know making the earth green or nice or pretty or making the rivers clean or preventing smoke from coming out or preventing tiny little particulates of um, co2 from flying in the atmosphere this only matters because you as a human being exist there to value it you know right. you want clean air you want clean little rivers you want to see virgin forests um, <laughs> that only matters because you're there to value it. And it's incoherent as an end in itself. It's um, because, you know, if, if that was the end on its own, well, then you die and then you can't value it and you can't even know if it's there. You know, we, we don't know that Earth is going to be this beautiful, pristine thing if we're all gone. And it doesn't even matter, you know, um, if, if we eliminate all life on Earth, we can't. But, you know, if we did, um, we wouldn't even know. We wouldn't even know how to value it or, or to know that it, it has been eliminated. But there's this, this, this mass incoherence at the heart of it, which is um, wanting to prioritize, wanting to optimize for Earth and ignoring the fact that you optimizing for Earth is just you optimizing for things you value. And so that has to be secondary to your own survival, because without your own survival, you won't be there. And I think this is really the key point that most people miss, which is your survival, um, as much as you might like to virtue signal about all the wonderful things you enjoy about nature, the fact that you can enjoy nature and your mere survival is a product of the technological advancement that humanity has achieved over the past years, decades, centuries, and millennia. You know, the, the reason we are here is because people invented wheels and that allowed us to increase our productivity massively. And then we invented engines and then we invented computers and all of that stuff. You know, humanity's technological heritage, our, all of these ideas and technologies that we have, they're the reasons that we are able to survive. And it's absolutely insane to you know, reach the pinnacle of all of this development and then think, oh yeah, we can just, uh, we can, let, let's cancel all of that basically and do without it. Yeah, I think, I, you know, I've more and more over the years really taken the perspective of like looking at the earth as the earth is naturally deficient and dangerous. And what human beings need to do is we need to increase our productive ability because that's what makes the earth an abundant and safe place, right? So it's, it's natural state left to its own devices is deficient and dangerous. It's you know, got very little value for us that we can readily consume. And then it has a lot of threats. And so it's all about our productive ability. And of course, you know, the wheel is a big step, but the, the step I'm most focused on is the step of delegating productive work to machines. And then the key, and you know, that allows you to do two things. It allows you to amplify your ability so you can have a modern, whatever you think of like modern food, you know, like a harvester can reap and thresh 700 times more wheat than the best human laborer. So it's that kind of amplification of ability. And then the expansion of ability, something like I talk about in both books, an incubator for a baby. That's something no number of humans can do with our physical bodies, but we can create a machine to do it. And so so much of our productive ability is having machines produce value for us and that we can only do that to the extent that the energy is low cost reliable 
versatile, meaning a bunch of different different kinds of machines, and then on a on a global scale. And so I think of it as like, we've made the Earth into an amazing, nourishing, and safe and opportunity filled place. And and you can think of it as like it, you're totally right. You need to view the Earth from a human perspective as a as a human environment so it's not like us versus the earth it's more like we optimize the earth to make it the most human friendly place possible and so yeah when we pr preserve a quote virgin forest but we're not really preserving things because we need of course we need to get there and we want to observe it and enjoy it but we're preserving or not based on what is best for us and then there's political questions of how you do that but ultimately the only way to coherently and morally do it is property rights so we get to decide hey with this part of the earth what is the best way to use it and it could be oh yeah well like i live at the beach it's like well yeah i don't want i want to preserve certain parts of the beach but i want to totally transform near the beach so i have access and i want to create certain kinds of seawalls so it doesn't cause too much trouble but it's all it's all optimizing the earth for human flourishing yeah, and I mean, there's this idea which I think is, um, is, is this kind of Disney National Geographic version of nature, where nature is just always beautiful. But really, nature means a lot of swamps and mosquitoes and um, unpleasant uh, uh, creatures that would hurt us and uh, would be terrible for us. And you know, some of the very nice places of the world today where. Um, filthy swamps at a certain point in time and it took a lot of effort and a lot of pumps and a lot of pipes and a lot of um, uh, very high power in order to be able to uh, to make these into you know the virgin nature that uh, people like to enjoy you know <laughs> yeah I and mean, that's a huge educational i don't mean to be too hard on disney stuff but this i call this the delicate nurture assumption so the view that nature the the unimpacted earth is stable, sufficient, and safe, and really it's it's dynamic, deficient, and dangerous. This is so pervasive. I really try in the new book to just hammer home how false this is, but it, it just, you always get, it's, it's a default. And just an example is how we think of climate. If you notice, so you can think of climate, or really CO2, as a side effect of fossil fuel use. So just as you need to look at a side effect of something, so you need to look at the benefit of something. And yet when we look at CO2, like you take food. So I have this example in the book of Michael Mann, who's one of the most, um, I don't know, prestigious, but certainly publicly famous climate scientists today. He, in my view, invented what's called the hockey stick that shows this unprecedented warming from, you know, over the last 2000 years. Google now, hide the decline. Uh, yeah, hide the decline, that whole Google interesting hide thing. the decline, yeah. But, but so he has a book and he talks about like, okay, here are the bad things we need to worry about from CO2 emissions from fossil fuels. And he just says like, oh, well, it's gonna screw up food. You know, it's gonna disrupt water in this way and these temperatures, da, 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 da. And one response to that is, okay, well, it leads to lower, longer growing seasons and more plant food in the air. So there's obviously gonna be a lot of good things about that side effect for food. But the main thing he ignores is he says not one word about all the fossil fueled machines that make food possible today. So just think about that. How could you possibly do that? And one perspective is, well, he's not really concerned about human life. And I think that is true to a significant extent. But the other perspective is, the other explanation is he's absorbed this delicate nurture assumption. So his view is, oh, as long as we don't impact nature, nature will give us plenty of food. And so the concern is, oh, are we impacting nature in a negative way? And that's why he can only, one reason he can only see, oh, CO2 might do these bad things. And, but it doesn't even think about, oh, the machines are doing all of these good things. It's just it's like totally oblivious yeah. to the way food exists today, totally depends on fossil fuels. And he, he can't see that because he has this mystical view of the earth. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's just you can't look at the impact of fossil fuels on food where, while taking out the fridge. You know, it's like he wants to keep the fridge there. He wants to keep yeah. refrigeration, refrigeration. He wants to keep trucks. He wants to keep all of the supply chain that we all rely on, you know, which if you turn it down, if you turn it off for a couple of weeks, millions would starve. He assumes that that can just be done without emitting carbon dioxide. And it's just a classic example of what economists say about the seen and the unseen. He wants to focus on, you know, the, supposedly the carbon dioxide is going to destroy Earth's ability to provide us with food. And he's missing the fact that, you know, without 
the fridges, we yeah, we wouldn't have the carbon dioxide, but most of us wouldn't be able to survive. You know, good luck making people in um, the world's big cities. You know, imagine how how are you going to feed people in Manhattan if they if you don't have refrigeration? Refrigeration. It's 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 an enormously enormously complicated problem, and uh, I mean it, it 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 would be devastating for humanity. But they don't advertise that. This is the kind of aggravating. Um, the, the the kind of really dishonest thing about it is that they don't they're not honest about the uh, real impact of what they're proposing and there's there's a very very um, naive perspective which is that well we just run all of this on solar and wind huh. and uh, all these renewable energies which I think is obviously massively problematic uh, can you tell us why you think this is the case as well yeah so but it, it's it should be suspicious that like, so you take man's book. So if it's true that solar and wind can actually do this and he knows this, you should at least mention, you at least need to still mention that our whole life in terms of food uh, depends on this. It's like there's, there's one particular antibiotic or something that we all depend on and you're, cl you're complaining about its side effects. You at least, and you're saying, oh, like, yeah, these side effects are bad. You need to talk about its benefits. And then you need to make a really, really strong argument that you have a replacement. And part of that argument is you're really worried about it. So the perspective of fossil fuels should be, look, these are totally keeping us alive. They make the world incredibly abundant and safe in a totally unprecedented way. If we lost this ability, or even if we failed to expand it, that would be an epic tragedy now let me make this incredible argument why we can rapidly replace it. And, and it, it's important, it, it is an incredible, if you look at all about the present, about how important fossil fuels are, but also how uniquely cost-effective they are. So I, as I said before, they provide 80% of the world's energy. This is after generations of competition, including from solar wind. So 80% of the world's energy, including very dominant in, in all forms of mobility, uh, any, any kind of heavy duty mobility, and then dominant in, in heat, and particularly heat for industry, which is crucial to making everything in the world. So you have something that, particularly with an economically savvy audience, something has an 80% market share after generations of competition, you really have to acknowledge, okay, there is something special about this. And you would really need an incredible argument for why something could replace it. And if you did have that argument, there's a question of why do you need to force it on people? Right? Why aren't they just allowing these magical things to compete? Why do they always have subsidies and mandates? So even before you look at the details of it, it's incredibly suspicious that they don't value it. They don't feel the need to explain the replacement. And there's a lot of implausibility to the replacement. And if you ask, well, what's so special about fossil fuels, which I think is important to get, I think there are two basic things. So one is they have these remarkable natural attributes. So they are naturally stored energy, naturally concentrated energy, naturally abundant. So naturally stored as in, they just, because of the processes that led to them, they just are a store of energy that you can just release essentially on demand. You have to refine them a little bit, but they store energy naturally, actually ancient sunlight. You, you compare that to solar and wind, which are intermittent flows of energy. So they're not stored, which makes them very hard to control because essentially you need to create your own storage system or some quasi storage system to make them useful. So natural storage is a huge advantage. The only three globally cost-effective sources of energy today uh, are, are um, fossil fuels, nuclear, and hydro, and they, they all involve natural storage. Hydro in a slightly different way, but basically you can dam it and, and nature brings the, the water to the top of the river uh, for you. So that's, that's one thing. And then they're naturally concentrated. Concentration and, or energy density is particularly key for mobility uh, and particularly for heavy duty mobility because you need to take your fuel with you. So the more compact it is and the lighter it is per unit of energy, uh, the better. And then they're abundant. So there's enough of them to last for an enormous amount of time. There's more than 10 times as much coal, oil, and gas in the earth as we've used in the whole history of civilization. So they've got that. And then they also have, and I think your audience will particularly appreciate this, they have generations of economic innovation and achievement. So it's not just they have these attributes, but actually millions of producers have figured out how do we take these fuels with these attributes and actually make them useful to billions of people in thousands of places for every purpose. So how do we use this oil fuel to make airlines available anywhere around the world, run 24 seven, et cetera. So this combination of these attributes and this achievement, really the only thing comparable in attributes is nuclear. 
um, which in some ways is superior, but it's more technically difficult to harness. And largely because of government criminalization, you don't have the generations of innovation and achievement. So you would need to liberate nuclear, decriminalize nuclear, and then apply all of that before it could be at all globally useful, right? It could be most useful for electricity relatively soon, but even there, it's a long slog because of what it is. But with these others, you know, you've studied, I know, biomass uh, a lot, you know, that creates all sorts of problems because you have, it doesn't, it's only naturally stored in very small quantities. Otherwise you have to farm it. And then that means you have to create this massive new stored source of energy yourself instead of just taking it from nature, refining it, and then releasing it. So these are the basic physical uh, and economic facts that lead to it. And if you get that, then yeah, you look in, in, in practice, what do solar and wind do? They only are useful for electricity, which right now is less than 20% of the world's overall energy. So there's also mobility and heat, which provides uh, the bulk of it. And much of that can't be electrified or can't be electrified cost effectively right now, even with cheap electricity. But then even for electricity, solar and wind, you look at where it's used, it's not creating this revolution of lower prices and higher reliability. It's creating this regression of higher prices and lower reliability. And the basic mechanism is because they're not controllable sources of energy, they don't replace the controllable sources of energy, namely coal, oil, gas, nuclear, hydro. Well, oil is just a little bit on electricity, right? They add to the cost. So you have to have the whole controllable energy, electricity infrastructure, and then you add this uncontrollable electricity infrastructure. And so that in invariably adds costs. We could go into the details of that. But I don't think it matters right now. So, and what happens then is you can, you can run a pretty reliable grid with a lot of what I call these unreliables or uncontrollables. Uh, but you have to preserve all of your controllable energy infrastructure. But what happens in California and Texas, they're like, well, this is expensive, right? Because we have to pay for these two sets of infrastructures. So what they try to do is they cut back on the controllable power plants, like in California, cutting back on nuclear, cutting back on natural gas. And then you're, you're doing what I call reliability chicken. So you're hoping that the weather complies. You're hoping that it's not too hot, it's not too cold, and you're hoping that the sun shines and the wind blows at just the right time so you can get away with the scheme. And what happened in California last year and what ha happened in Texas this year is the failure of reliability uh, chicken. So in practice, what these are is these are not promising replacements. They are, um, they are cost adding supplements. And so this so-called energy transition we're going through is a total myth. It's, you can look at it from two ways. It's either an energy regression because we're making electricity more expensive and less reliable or you could call it, it's an unreliable energy addition because we're not reducing fossil fuel use actually, we're just adding unreliable um, energy. So if you, if you understand the actual, what is actually happening with solar and wind and what they're doing, the idea of them being a replacement is just totally arbitrary. And it's either, you know, it's, it's either just ignorance or just total dishonesty by people who don't care at all about energy. Because imagine caring about energy and realizing, oh, the world needs much more and seeing that track record in present and saying, oh yeah, let's just replace it all with this total failure. I mean, it would be, it's like a total disregard for human life if you understand energy. And, and if you don't understand energy, you should not be talking about policies in energy. Yeah, I, I agree with you entirely. I think it's 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 kind of it's very misleading to say that uh, solar and wind and biomass will add up to say I think it's it's three to five percent or something like that of into total energy consumption, but it's kind of misleading to even give them that because I like to use the term their their fossil fuel laundering. It's basically um, taking fossil fuels to build these giant windmills, and then putting the windmills up and then taking recouping some of the fossil fuel output that went into producing these things as um, energy and then using it. And I think the, 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 the key point, which I discuss in, um, in my next book, um, after the Fiat Standard, I'm writing also an economics textbook, um, uh, Principles of Economics, is that energy itself is not something that's valuable. What's really valuable is power power at a certain place at a certain time. So energy is infinite. You know, there's wind blowing all over the earth at all times. And there's sunlight falling on the earth. The amount of sunlight that hits the earth in an hour, I think, is larger than the amount of energy that all humans consume in a year or something like that. Yeah, or maybe it's I'm in a day. Honest. Something in that regard. So energy itself is massively, massively abundant. Um, what matters is having the energy in the form that you want 
at the intensity that you want you know this amount of energy in this amount of time directed toward meeting your particular need and so when they calculate you know that we have this much wind they're measuring the total capacity of these wind plants if the wind is blowing and they're measuring the total capacity of the solar plants if the solar plants uh, if the sun is shining and the solar panels are uh, not dusty and um all of the you know all the stars are aligning then yeah you have all of this output coming out but uh, that's not really very useful as a metric because you know people need uh, a particular amount of energy at a particular point in time and for that you know you need the fossil fuels as a backup and if you don't have the fossil fuels as a backup then that uh, then you know you can have catastrophic and lethal failure you know people die i mean um you know children and, and children in, uh, in in hospitals on you know premature babies die if they don't get electricity to their incubators it's as simple as that so if the sun isn't shining and the wind isn't blowing then you know your alternative energy plan means we just need to sacrifice all of our uh, premature babies which is what humanity did for the vast majority of human life you know for the vast majority of humanity premature babies weren't able to survive but now with electricity we can build those incubators where they can survive and a lot of the people walking amongst us today a lot of the people who are inventing amazing things who are producing amazing things some of your friends were premature babies and they're only alive thanks to the fact that they had regular 24-hour electricity so um adding the kind of it's 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 uh, you know adding on all of these um um unreliable and unstable um, energy sources which are produced only through fossil fuels and considering it you know saying oh well they're responsible for five percent and they've gone from one percent to five percent over the last 10 or 20 years or so and so obviously continue to extrapolate because you know everything is exponential in today's world so obviously this is if it goes from one to five it's going to go to five thousand percent in a few years <laughs> Um, that's obviously nonsense. It's it, it, it's it's kind of like the, the the participation trophy of energy, where these are just yeah, you know, we have the fossil fuels actually what's doing all the work, and these they, these kind of children, you know, these they're like the children dragged along to just make them feel better about the fact that they're contributing. It's like um, it's it's like you know, you have a plastic steering wheel that you give to your child in the back seat so that they think that they're driving the car while you're driving the car. This is kind of what these things are. You know, we wouldn't have them if we didn't have uh, the actual steering wheel steering the car. And <laughs> without the car going around and the father being able to make money and earn money, he wouldn't be able to afford this little plastic wheel that he gives to his child at the backseat to keep the child quiet while the dad is uh, driving. Um, but it's really it's it, it's not fair to say that, you know the dad did 95 percent of the driving and the kid did five percent of the driving <laughs> because he was holding that wheel yeah I mean, it is important that they are depend like everything is dependent on fossil fuels today it's part of the lie of net zero i mean one thing that's important about what they call net zero is there's not one prosperous person let alone area of the world that is net zero in a way that can be scaled so you can think about something like, oh, can Jeff Bezos be net zero? I mean, obviously he consumes a lot, but yeah, you could imagine he could plant a bunch of mangroves somewhere, right? And different trees somewhere. And it's like theoretically absorb the CO2, but that doesn't scale at all. In fact, all these tree planting things have massive scalability problems because you're creating uneconomic, more uneconomic forests than already exist. And that creates all these forest fire, even more forest fire dangers. But if you just look at the numbers, there's no way to plant trees and absorb all the CO2 that we're uh, emitting. And there's no way to do anything right now that in a way that's remotely cost-effective at scale. So net zero, again, it's something that, the reason I call it genocidal is it's something that nobody actually does today in a scalable way. And they're saying it should absolutely be mandatory to do it in less than 30 years. Again, in a world that's deprived, of, uh, that, that's very short of energy from a human perspective. The, the other thing with the, you know, the plastic steering wheels, it's, it, it's notable that these uncontrollable sources of energy, they're almost exclusively used on the grid. And the grid is this amazing invention. I mean, the grid allows, you think about what it does. It allows us to take unpredictable demand and meet it instantaneously. I mean, it's really a remarkable achievement. Like all of us at any given time, you know, you can use a lot more electricity and the grid totally handles it. So it's like, it's, it takes uncontrollable demand 
and it meets it. And the way that it does that is through highly, highly controllable supply. That's the only, re that's the only way to meet uncontrollable demand. And what they're doing is they're adding uncontrollable supply. So it's really a vicious thing, but you can only get away with it because the rest of the supply is so controllable. And so there's this, this parasitism. And one of the dangers of this is that there's huge uh, accounting fraud that can take place because it ultimately all exists as one machine. So you can do, for example, what Apple does, and you can say, oh, well, we're 100% renewable because we paid somebody to give us the credit for the solar and wind that other people used, and we paid for them to get the blame for the coal and nuclear and natural gas. That's literally what happens. That's these renewable electricity credits. That's what it does. It's you're paying for the credit for somebody else. But in practice, what's happening is it's a relatively small percentage of the solar and wind. And then they are parasites on the controllable sources of power. And then there's all of this dishonesty. But notice people, nobody's building a factory with just solar and wind, right? There, there's no self, whereas you could build yes. a factory with just you know coal or just gas. I and mean, there are reasons you don't, a grid is better, but there are no real, besides people living off the grid at a very low level, there are not, no self-sufficient solar and wind solutions. So it's another piece of evidence that these are not all they're cracked up to be. Because if they were so cost-effective, if storage was so cheap, solar panels were so cheap, you would just have all these independent plants that use them and there are zero of those. Yeah, absolutely. I've, I've always liked to say, you know, it, I wish all these uh, Silicon Valley um, tech giants would try and run their servers for a week, on, just for a day on uh, purely uh, all these renewable energy sources. Like just imagine if Amazon or Apple had to, <laughs> you know, time their operations based on how fast the wind is blowing and how uh, how strong the sun is shining. And particularly, uh, you know, just imagine, well, today, you know, we can't, well, we got to stop production on the iPads uh, for the afternoon. Everybody take the afternoon off because the sun is not shining, the wind is not blowing. And so- I mean, it would be, it, it, that's even so charitable though. Because it's not, it's just the precision, it's, it's just so important, like the precision of controllable energy sources is so much different than what's happening with the sun and the wind. I mean, you need something to buffer. It's not like you can literally like go up and down precisely as the sun shines. I mean, it'd just be total chaos and nothing would work uh, at yeah. all. But yeah, so it's a good, it's a good kind of, it's a funny thing to think about, but it's even, it's even worse than you can imagine. And it's so bad and so unacceptable that these companies are portraying it. And, and it asks, oh, we really are running on this. And then even some of the oil companies are complicit. So BP has this absolutely horrendous ad that I find so offensive where they're talking about natural gas and, and they're, they have this, it's in somewhere in Iowa, I think. Some, I think some state begins with an I. And it's just, they have the wind, it, it portrays it as the wind is blowing all the time. So everyone's hat is blowing and flags are blowing and trees, like the, the wind is blowing all the time. And the message is, oh, occasionally the wind dies down. So you need natural gas. And so that's the model, right? Oh, there's all this abundant renewable stuff. And then occasionally you need to burn a little bit of gas and oh, please let us do that. And it's like, that's not at all what's happening. It's really, there are these luxury goods, these solar panels and wind turbines, and we are paying to add them to the system to feel good about ourselves. Yeah, speaking of oil companies, um, sometimes people will accuse you of being a uh, paid shill of the oil companies. And I find this hilarious because if you actually look at what the oil companies are doing, I mean, BP has officially renamed itself from British Petroleum to Beyond Petroleum, right? And now they, I think they just went back to BP, but they're, now they have all the rhetoric. Yeah, they're definitely not yeah. British Petroleum anymore. Yeah, and, I, and, and all of the big major oil companies are constantly virtue signaling about uh, uh, wind and solar and the climate crisis and all that nonsense and uh, you're not paid <laughs> by uh, oil companies why do you think th this i find it really fascinating i don't have very good answers to it why do you think oil companies are not out there uh, talking about the benefits of oil you know like people i mean companies that sell poisonous junk food are out there trying to find a way you know they're paying off nutrition scientists to tell the world that you know eating a little bit of our poisonous junk in moderation occasionally 
which you know is highly addictive so you can't even eat it in moderation occasionally but at least they they, they do go through the effort of paying people to say that um, and to pretend but why don't oil companies try and defend their product it's amazing i mean um they they, they have a product that's entirely essential for modern life and yet they join the enemies of that product in um, attacking it. Why do you think that is the case? Well, I think it's, it's, these two things are very related. And I'll talk a second about my particular relationship with the industry, but note that it's considered totally damning to be financially associated with the oil industry, which, you know, from my perspective, so I came to all of my ideas before I'd even met anyone from the industry, but from my perspective from the beginning, if I could have worked for an oil company early on, I certainly would have because I thought of it as very good. I thought of it as like, oh, you know, I can work for a food company that's producing the most nutritious life enhancing food. Of course I would do that, right? And of course I would want to spend time. I would ha be happy to be on their payroll talking about the virtues of it. So that's not the way that it worked out, but it, it comes, all of this is based on, we have this negative moral evaluation of the oil industry, more broadly fossil fuels and more broadly industry. So we have this association, oh, if you're connected to them, um, it's bad. Whereas my view is no, if, if you independently think of it as good, uh, it's good to be connected to them. And it's, you know, since I started, yeah, I've had different relationships with oil companies, including I'll speak for them and I'll consult for them. And, it, and in the last couple of years, I've actually had things which people can, and can fund, including helping with my energy talking points work and stuff. Um, I set it up so that I can be totally independent and nobody has any editorial control. But I regard like association with the oil industry as a very good thing for reasons that I can clearly uh, explain, something I came to on my own. But, and so then you ask, well, why aren't they bold? Well, think about it. If you're an industry that's viewed as so evil that association with you is considered damning, then it takes a lot of clarity and courage to really stand up to that. And most businesses are not teeming with clarity and courage in terms of cultural issues, in part because it's not their specialty. Like their specialty is producing the thing really well, uh, but they don't really have the the inner intellectual wherewithal to combat that. And often many of them are steeped in the same things themselves. This is not unique to oil, just throughout history, you've looked at on so few business people have stood up for capitalism and understood that. And sometimes there are opportunistic reasons for that, like rent seeking type stuff, but sometimes it's not that. Sometimes it's just like they don't have the ammunition, they don't uh, understand. So I'm sympathetic in large part to, to their situation to a certain point. I'm sympathetic to where they don't have the ammunition, when they don't have the ammunition. And a lot of what I've tried to do and still do with energytalkingpoints.com and my newsletter and books and stuff is provide them the ammunition. Where I'm not sympathetic is where I think it's really status seeking. And this is I think, a lot of behavior of wealthy people that does a lot of destruction where they're just looking for, oh, I want, I want to be like, I'm buying into this climate catastrophe stuff because that's gonna get me invited to cocktail parties or get me to keep my position. Like if you're a multi, multi-millionaire, you know, you're set for life financially, you really should use that to say what you think. I think you should always try to say what you think, um, but certainly if you're independently wealthy, there's no excuse for saying false things just for your own status. And I think a lot of that happens because I've talked to so many, I know the oil industry really well, I've talked to so many people, I cannot tell you how many people I've talked to whose private position is very different than what their company publicly uh, says. And by that's one reason why with almost all of these large oil companies, I won't associate with them or deal with them at all financially uh, because they are, I think they're doing dishonest and destructive things, unfortunately. Yeah, I think there's a disconnect here between uh, the um, small companies and the large publicly traded companies. Uh, the publicly traded companies, a lot of it is about securing fiat funding. And this is a point that uh, I think f listeners here will be familiar with. You know, in, in, in the fiat economy, value is not assigned by consumers. If, and if you had a hard money, then you, the more you serve people, the more people pay you money. But when the money comes from above, uh, a, a bigger contributor to your success is your ability to secure financing. And in particular, you know, the interest rate at which you're able to borrow is probably the most important factor in the success of your business. And so if you happen to be uh, well-connected politically, if you happen to be 
on the right side of uh, PR, on the right side of politics, then you're able to be connected to the correct banks and you get the right interest rate. And that's, I think, how a lot of these public companies um, have to, to function. And it's not just also the interest rates about you know securing investment from other companies and from banks and from um, you know uh, public uh, stock offerings and all of that stuff. A lot of it is, has to do with just uh, putting out a nice image in public because if you don't do that, then it doesn't matter much if you are able to secure profit. And I think. The, uh, the the boycott movement and the uh, ESG movement is playing a massive role in this. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your thoughts on ESG, what this is accomplishing? The ESG starts for, stands for Environmental, Social, and uh, okay. Governance Metrics. And it's just this um, way of judging corporations through things other than their profitability. And it's um, it sounds like it's just corporate uh, fluff, but it's actually becoming more and more important because um, it's uh, you know if you want to get massive amounts of financing, you need to take all of these boxes, and it's becoming increasingly influential. Tell tell us more about uh, how and why. Yeah, definitely. And um, by the way, I have this website I've mentioned, energytalkingpoints.com. If you just go there, you can search any term, but I'd particularly recommend searching ESG because I have a bunch of material on ESG. So as you said, it stands for environmental social governance. And before I talk about what's bad about it, let's talk about what's plausible about it. And I think what's plausible about it is that long-term value creation is, a, is an important thing and not all businesses always do it. So you're, if you think about like, okay, I want to create profit, I want to increase or maximize shareholder value, that requires not just one quarter of profits, requires maximizing profits over the long term. And so you need a long-term attitude. And that, that can encompass different kinds of things, including you want good governance, so you don't want bad governance that's just allowing some uh, you know, person to control the company who exploits the company or does something really short term that, that looks good for a quarter, but then ends up being bad. And you want things like you want to follow the law as well, and you want to have good relationships with different kinds of communities that you associate with. So that's a legitimate kind of thing. But the so I call this actually long term value creation. I think that's there's legitimate thinking about how do you be a long term value creator? What are the practices associated with this? this? And I think that's a valid area of inquiry. And it should be voluntary and people should, should think about it and discuss it. But what ESG is doing is they're pretending basically, oh, we're going to help with long-term value creation. And what we have done as these ESG geniuses is we have, we have identified the best practices in how we deal with environmental issues, how we deal with social issues, and then governance. But really in practice, it's their environmental attitudes and their social attitudes are totally against good government. Because in social issues, it's, I mean, to put it bluntly, it's racism. That's their basic view in terms of like different kinds of quotas based on skin color and all these other, I think, invalid things that are non-individualistic, non-merit-based, non-based on productive ability. Um, and then on the environmental side of it, it basically just means anti-fossil fuels. So it means that you should pledge to eliminate your use of fossil fuels, or if you're an energy company, uh, you know, eliminate or your fossil fuel company, eliminate your production of fossil fuels. Now, this is not good for long-term value in the world. This is destructive of all long-term value in the world because all long-term value depends on the energy industry because that powers every other industry. And the energy industry totally depends on, on fossil fuels. So what they've done is they've gotten under the idea of long-term value creation. They've, they've instituted fossil fuel elimination as this guiding principle or, or rule for every company. And there's all this government entanglement because of the government roles in the stock exchanges and because of what the SEC does and all of its control. And there's a lot of private type of things. But what's happening is the idea of fossil fuel elimination is not only being pursued politically, but it's actually even more effectively being pursued quasi-politically through what they'll call corporate governance. So they'll get Exxon to agree to drill less, or they'll get Chevron to agree to some commitment. They'll, you know, it, it contributes to BP agreeing to be net zero. This is a fossil fuel company, net zero by 2050. Shell agreeing to be net zero by 2050. So it's this, this incredibly fascistic form of government, of governance that's being done on financial markets by corporations, by these activists. So really they came up with an ingenious strategy 
to impose their fascistic policies without having to win over voters. And it turns out voters are much, not very rational, I would say in general, but much more rational than these status seeking ESG people. And the, the reason is, be, I think, because the status seekers, they have no fear about their day to day survival and well being. They feel like, oh, that's taken care of. You know, I'm a multimillionaire, I'm a billionaire, like that's taken care of. They're optimizing often for status. And that really scares me. You have a bunch of people optimizing for status with no connection to the life and death realities of energy for, for most people. Like that's why you're getting all of these terrible commitments. And it's, it's very, very hard to fight. It's very ominous. Yeah, I mean, I think um, all of this stuff up until a few years ago, for me, it was a fascinating example of corruption and just how incentives in this modern fiat economy are so messed up. And for me, you know, the result of this was that a bunch of hucksters are going to make a lot of money because, you know, they know how to play this. And a bunch of environmentalist uh, religious fanatics are going to feel self-important about it. But it was only really in the last few years when I started to realize uh, this is actually far more uh, devastating. It's, it's not just that a few people are going to make unearned, unearned wealth and status from this. This is actually truly dismantling the industrial infrastructure of the modern world. And I think what we've seen in the last few years, and in particular this year, is beginning to um, look really scary. I think we see energy prices rising. Um, you know, Britain and Germany are great examples where the pro cost of energy is going up massively. We see uh, grid failures during um, times of peak load. Um, Texas and California come to mind. We see power plants being closed. You know, New York has closed its nuclear power plant, and um, you know they're going into this winter now, um, basically like somebody going into a fight without a gun, um, and into a war without a gun. Um, you know, they've shut up, shut down their uh, biggest nuclear plant and they're dismantling all of the fossil fuel infrastructure that they need. And also, I think a major point related to all of the ESG nonsense is that the ability to invest in all in new projects has been massively compromised over the past few years. And now we're beginning to um, feel the crunch. You know, the, the investments that should have taken place 10, 15 years ago in order to meet the demands of the grid today did not take place 10, 15 years ago because 10, 15 years ago, people were too busy virtue signaling about um, the carbon dioxide nonsense, uh, destroying the earth. And uh, now, you know, instead of maintaining whatever capacity we have, we're actually still we're dismantling some of that capacity. And so the result is, historically, all of human history, we've had the cost of energy go down over time you know we we discover windmills and we start using windmills and that gives people more energy we domesticate uh horses and now we're starting to have the energy of horses and that gives us more energy to serve our needs and so every year we're making our um uh, our ability to command energy stronger and better but it looks like the last 10 20 years or so we're beginning to reverse that trend we're now witnessing the cost of energy go up for a lot of people um tell us a little bit more about the kind of um manifestations of this how the causes and the impacts that this has and i, I and and um uh, what you think uh, the the where, where do you think this trend is taking us I mean, really, it's it since the 70s, more or less, where you see a lot of this decline. I think the key is that, you know, ultimately, so I, I in a sense, energy is fundamental, right? Because it's the industry that powers every other industry. But then from another perspective, money is fundamental. Finance is fundamental, right? Because that's that's delivering the capital that decides, you know, that decide that determines where different kinds of resources go. And, and just as a sideline on ESG, think about like what ESG is trying to do is it's trying to fundamentally misallocate capital. Like it's trying to take the industry that powers every other industry and then take away cost-effective energy and mandate cost ineffective energy. And that's why it's so fundamentally destructive to do that. Um, and, and part of what it's doing is it's, it's interfering with what would normally happen, which is you know freedom. So if you have the freedom to allocate capital uh, un, unrestrained by all this ESG, stuff and you have the freedom to develop 
then you can expect over time that energy will become more and more cost effective. We look at like the modern environmental movement becoming dominant since the 70s, what do they do? Well, they restrict the freedom to develop, which is the freedom to transform nature to meet our needs. The more transformative the activity involved, the more that's affected. So if you're in software, it's not affected a huge amount. It's affected by all the hardware that the software depends on. But for the software, at least, like you can start a software company and the modern anti-impact environmental movement, they're not going to stop you, like really. But if you're trying to start, you know, you're trying to drill for oil or you're trying to innovate in nuclear, that's where you really get hammered. So this whole anti-human impact movement, it's called the environmental movement, but it's really an anti-human impact movement. You know, that rises in the late 60s and 70s. And that just has a total destructive impact because it means that any idea you have about how to produce energy cost effectively may not be allowed to be implemented in practice. It's, it's putting the stop between your ability to identify how to produce energy cost effectively and your ability to implement it. You contrast this with the past. I've, I had an article maybe 12 years ago called Energy at the Speed of Thought. And it was about the early oil market and how that emerged. And it talked about there were all these competing industries. And part of what happened was if you had an idea about a productive way to produce, a, a cost-effective way to produce energy, you could just implement it immediately. Like if you wanted to build a pipeline, yeah, you weren't allowed to just dump oil on people's land, so you had to build it well, but you could build like the first pipeline, I forget, it was three months or something like that, a, a significant pipeline. And think about how long it takes to build a yoga studio today. So this inability, this lack of freedom to develop is a huge inhibition. And then we're adding to that, this fascistic ESG, control of companies. And so those two forces are an enormous and fundamental drag on the entire economy. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's, um, it's, it's, it's almost, um, it, it's kind of unthinkable on one level. And then on the other level, it's, it's, it's normalized how people have just accepted the idea that it's becoming more expensive to keep your house warm in the winter. And yeah, that's just normal. You know, people just think, well, yeah, well, there's a climate crisis, so obviously, or it's blackouts more are normal. That's that's even scarier. Yeah, it's just an inevitable failure of capitalism. That capitalism is going to lead to uh, the fact that we can't maintain grids running. But um, this is becoming a huge problem. Um, Britain, you know, which is hosting this problem, uh, this conference now has the most expensive energy cost in Europe, I think, or is it Germany who's the leader? Germany Germany, point? and Denmark are usually the competitors in electricity. But yeah, UK has all kinds of, of problems. Yeah, it is norm the normalization is really scary. At the, and even you look at just with, I forget what they call the like global supply chain crisis. I don't know what the euphemism is, but just the- It's called the climate what, crisis. Right, but it's all like, yeah, it's all like, it, completely bizarrely connected to climate. Like, oh my God, the weather changed so much, we can't do anything. It's totally detached from reality. But you just look at even the current, just all these failures of logistics around the world. If you understand freedom and capitalism, you immediately look at that and say, whatever else is going on, there is some impediment to freedom because free human beings are not going to have these kinds of problems. But without understanding freedom and capitalism, uh, then, you're susceptible, like you don't automatically assume government intervention is the cause of the problem. And you're susceptible, you're susceptible to all these completely bizarre explanations like, oh, climate change caused it, which has no real causality at all. But you also are in danger of normalizing it because you don't have the, the normal, the normal we've experienced the last 200 years with freedom and fossil fuels is that life keeps getting better and better. And that's a good thing to normalize as long as we appreciate its causes. But what's happening is there's not an appreciation of it. And there's just like, oh, yeah, okay, and natural gas is going to be 30% more expensive this year. Or, yeah, they're having 5x price spikes in Europe. Oh, I guess that's happening. That seems, or like, oh, yeah, there was a disaster in Texas. Oh, that sucks. But not just, we are human beings in 2021. This should not be happening. There has to be a catastrophic amount of government coercion for us to not be able to produce reliable electricity. And the reliable electricity was a huge achievement, but it's so easy to do with our current knowledge. It can only be massive government intervention that prevents it. I mean, like we've been able to do it for generations, produce reliable electricity. So there really needs to be an outrage about it. And 
And so I'm, I'm glad you have that. And I'm sure your listeners have that, but that's, it's important to keep that perspective and never to normalize all of this dysfunction. I think it's another good thing about the Bitcoin movement is not normalizing um, government control of money and not acting like, oh, and that's really normalized, right? But like, oh yeah, somebody can just randomly decide how much my money is worth. That's okay. Like, no, that's not okay. I should get to decide how I want to engage in indirect exchange with other people. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, one story I always like to mention is um, in Lebanon. Uh, Lebanon has got a grid that is uh, almost non-existent at this point. It yeah. was doing something like two, three hours a day for some people. And it went days where people didn't get any electricity during the summer. Um, it was failing in every measure. And it's been, it's it, they, they've not had 24-hour electricity for decades now. But there was, um, and to the point where, you know, most people today just think, you know, most people in Lebanon just think, well, 24-hour electricity is just not something that we can have in Lebanon because, you know, we're not a first world country. And um, the, if you want 24-hour electricity, just go to France or uh, the U.S. or Canada or something, migrate or to the Emirates. Um, but there was, somebody posted a news uh, newspaper clipping from the 1960s in which it was a front page announcement by the electricity company that the power was going to be out today for 20 minutes for oh, uh, maintenance. And it was in the 1960s that Lebanese were able to have 24 hour electricity to the point that a 20 minute uh, interruption was front page announcement in the newspaper. This is, this is what it was like in the 1960s. So people's grandparents had normalized the ability to have 24 hour electricity in the 1960s. And now uh, the, kids today just don't think that it is possible and the sad and frightening thing is that you see this now happening in the west you know people are just getting used to the idea of um having a backup generator and i think um I, I think it was robert bryce as well who wrote an article in the wall street journal yeah. about um how the biggest company for making generators in the u.s is booming uh, in, in, in a way that they hadn't imagined because everybody's buying a generator because everybody's witnessing their grid fail. Everybody rich rhythm. is buying a generator, of course. I mean, it's yeah, so, I should, ex I guess. so expensive. I mean, it's, it's like, you think about, again, the grid is such an achievement. It's ability yeah. to provide controllable, like to handle uncontrollable demand with highly controllable supply, but just the economies of scale involved in having some centralized power plants that are fairly near you, that have this combination of, you know, base, just even the way it works, it's like so well designed, like they have the base load, which is like the minimum amount that you'll need. And they have what's called load following. So when it goes up and down, you can track it and you can produce it efficiently. And then they have peaking. So if you get these emergency needs, okay, you can, you can run natural gas for a short amount of time. It costs a little bit more to have one of those plants. Like it's amazing. And eventually, you know, you can use batteries for some of that, but it's like this amazing achievement that makes electricity so cheap. You know, in terms of people can have electric bills and, you know, $100 a month and have all these amazing machines. And yet now we're talking about, oh, yeah, well, let's just buy a generator for $10,000 or $20,000. I mean, what is that for somebody's budget? But it's so easy when you're wealthier to just normalize. Oh, like, yeah. And I, look, I'm guilty of this, too. I'm like, no above average income, certainly. And in California, like I think about, hey, maybe I could still live in California and I just have to buy a generator for, I have to figure out a generation situation for 20 or 30 grand. Well, that's just totally out of reach for most people. And, yeah. and we're, so we're destroying this thing in such a regressive way. Absolutely. And I think, you know, the lesson from a place like Lebanon and there are many other places like that is that, yeah, you could maybe get a generator, but I think if you live in a place that can't run a grid, then things are going to go to shit in many, many, many other different ways. Like if, if you live in a place where they had the grid and now they can't run the grid anymore, you're not going to be saved by yeah. a generator, even if your yeah. generator is going to give you 24 hour electricity. Because this is what happened in Lebanon in the summer. You know, for many years, it used to be the case in Lebanon that if you were rich, you had a generator. And it wasn't just rich people. It was, um, you know, even middle income people in Lebanon because the energy goes out for so often. There are generators everywhere. So there are small kind of power utility companies that will have a small generator connected to say 100 houses or 500 houses and there's some economies of scale there you don't have to handle the generator you don't have to handle the maintenance so this was extremely common and of course it's extremely expensive in terms of the um, environmental impact of it because it, you have all these um, generators making a lot of suit in the middle of the city in the residential areas which is filthy 
but uh, that also fails because if you can't manage a grid, well, guess what? You can't manage the fuel supply. And during the summer, there was a shortage of fuel and the government was handling it. And there was a smuggling problem because they were subsidizing the fuel. People were smuggling it into Syria. And that's why even if you were rich, you didn't have 24-hour electricity in Lebanon. And I think most people, even today, they still don't have 24-hour electricity, um, no matter how rich they are. And it's, uh, well, maybe not everybody, but I mean, I think, uh, I'm, I'm sure the politicians don't, to suffer from this uh, problem of power interruption but for the vast majority of the population even the rich people they can't have it and i think this is an extremely important point that a lot of people in the bitcoin community seem to underestimate um, which is the importance of the grid i think a lot of people have this idea that well you know as bitcoiners we need to break away from fiat society and we'll have our own citadels and our own little societies where we're um, independent of them and a lot of these projects for um, being independent and, and and you know living off the grid a lot of this has a lot of romanticism but a lot of these projects fail for the very simple reason of the economies of scale of the grid and uh, food production the economy of scale involved in food production is one but i think that's probably manageable if you're a carnivore because you know you just need a few cows and you're sorted uh, but i think the real issue is the electricity because if you're connected to a grid you're able to get electricity at what 5 10 15 20 cents per kilowatt hour which is incredibly cheap and you're only able to do something like this if you have a certain amount of scale. You know, if you, you've got half a million houses or a million houses or two million houses connected to the same grid, only then can you get this kind of uh, cost. And then all the other solutions, you know, if you're going to have your own generator. It's extremely expensive. And it's extremely expensive, not just in, in the sense of you have to pay a one-off fee. Uh, to buy the generator and then life goes on. No, it's a constantly high running cost where you need to keep buying fuel and you need to be keep, keep paying. And so the cost of uh, generating fuel from these generators is much higher than from the grid. And this is this is kind of the the, the kind of depressing reality about uh, modern industrial life. The thing that we we take for granted and that we want to live with and we can't even uh, really credibly expect to survive um, with the kind of living standard we like without it, it is highly dependent on the grid. The fact that we have all these electric machines that we just, for most of us, uh, we take them for granted, most of us outside of Lebanon and at these dysfunctional places, we take this for granted. The idea that you just march into your house and you flick a switch and the lights go on, you open the fridge, you never have to worry about the fridge not having power. You can do your laundry whenever you want. You can turn on your TV and uh, your computer whenever you want. All of that stuff is functioning on demand. The ability to have all of that is a, a, a result of the grid. And going off the grid is going to deprive you of this or is going to be extremely, extremely expensive. And that's... Um, it's, 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 it's a sobering note for people who think that they can just separate from society. Unfortunately, you know, the economies of scale mean that we we need all of this critical infrastructure for us to have our modern life. We need society, unfortunately. Well, I wonder, I mean, and it's particularly, you know, it's it's even more acute for just producing the goods, right? So there's 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 like, okay, I have all these finished goods at home, like okay, I have an iPhone, and that's that requires electricity. And how do I provide that? But the main thing is how do you provide all the energy that's used to make the iPhone? And that's used to run all the infrastructure, the communications infrastructure, the iPhone uh, depends on. I mean, it, I have a, I wonder, I have kind of a thought experiment of what if, like, what if the anti-impact movement, like, let's say they, if they somehow just controlled the grid or is the government just monopolizing the grid, but we were free to develop, including develop nuclear, it's plausible to me that there would be like a disproportionate amount of innovation and like local solutions, like, oh, a giant nuclear battery, you know, that you can get at once and it'll last you your whole lifetime or something. And it's produced in a factory. Like, I think you would have that in the same way that you have a lot of uh, innovations in mobile stuff, because like, I think there's more innovation in mobile than there would otherwise be just because the government monopolizes building the physical cables everywhere. And so, you even though certain things would be faster to do with physical cables, you'll do them with mobility because with mobility you have more freedom to innovate. 
But the problem is you don't have the freedom to innovate in home power production because the government stops the freedom to develop. And this is particularly acute with something like nuclear, which is one of the more plausible things. So yeah, if you look at what does it cost to have a propane generator at your house that can power your house? I mean, these, you're talking like six figures to do this. And, and again, the contrast is cheap electricity can be $100 or less a month. So you're talking about about $1,000 a year. And then you're talking about these cool solutions that are six figures. And so rich people, yeah, it's not that big a deal for them. Even the amount of time people spend on solar panels is bizarre. Like I was talking to a rich guy a couple of years ago, and he was telling me about his solar panels and all the problems he's having, and he's going up and dusting them. And I'm thinking like, you're a multimillionaire and you are spending your time on this. And this is another regression. Like, oh yeah, now you're a manual labor who's dusting off freaking solar panels instead of just, you pay literally, like if, let's say this guy had a, $400 a month electric bill. I'm sure he made over $400 an hour. So it's literally one hour of his time can power all of his machines. That's what a, that's what a grid makes. The, the economies of scale of the grid just make possible. So yeah, people should not take that for granted at all. They should also not assume as many Bitcoiners do that. Oh yeah, well, solar and wind will be just as good uh, for Bitcoin. Yeah, the, uh, the 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 Bitcoiners, uh, a lot of Bitcoiners are kind of uh, similar to the oil industry in that they they're trying to be uh, you know they're trying to appeal to the ESG crowd, and so there is this narrative that Bitcoin is going to run on solar, wind, and angel farts uh, by the year twenty thirty, which I think is um, extremely extremely unlikely. Um, I mean, it's it's it, it, it's unthinkable, and I think it's just that they're trying to fit this narrative to appeal to people. But it's 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 completely it's completely unrealistic. You need they should just do it off the grid if they can. I mean, that's what I'm waiting for. Just who's who's buying a bunch of solar panels and a bunch of batteries and have their own little farm, and they're not connected to the grid. Like as soon as they do that, I'll believe them. But right now, what I see is just a bunch of parasitism off the grid. A bunch of like, you know, a bunch of paying for renewable credit or a bunch of adding a bunch of solar and wind that then creates a huge problem. Just like in California, we have way too much solar right now, right? So we generate way more solar than we need certain parts of the day. And then we don't have in other parts of it. So we need to export excess and then we need to import when we're way short of it. And so it's, you're not doing anyone any favors by building more uncontrollable infrastructure for the grid, but they act like, oh, well, this is a heroic thing and I get to put it in my report and I can get more investors this way. There really is a scam that's made possible by the interconnectedness of the grid. Yeah, and it's, um, I mean, it's, 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 it's also extremely expensive. It's also, made, it's really only made possible by subsidies and none, none of these, um, I, I don't think any of the uh, solar and wind connected miners would exist at all if it wasn't for the massive subsidies that have already gone into these projects, uh, private sector enterprise would not put their money there. Nobody with actual money would have been investing in, in, in these projects, but people keep investing in them because there's a lot of uh, subsidies in them. I think it was uh, Warren Buffett who said, um, we invest in wind plants generate subsidies. They don't generate electricity. That's why he invests in them. Um, and I think, yeah, this is, uh, you know, in, in, in particular in the case of Bitcoin, uh, sure, you're going to be using all of these um, unreliable parasitic sources of energies for all kinds of different things. But for Bitcoin, it's extremely unsuitable because Bitcoin mining is an extremely, extremely competitive industry. So if your miner is going to be profitable, it has to be profitable compared to other miners. It's, it, it, it's, it's unique in that regard. Well, not so much unique, but I think it's it's uh, it's an extreme version of competition because Bitcoin has this thing called difficulty adjustment, which is the most fascinating part of Bitcoin for me, which I discussed in my uh, first book, The Bitcoin Standard. And the difficulty adjustment is always making mining harder and more expensive the more people get into mining. It's, it's ensuring that the reward for mining remains the same no matter how many people get into it. And so that's why... Only the strongest survive with Bitcoin mining. If you're going to be successful as a Bitcoin miner, you have to be among the most uh, cost efficient among all the miners. And so to stand the chance of succeeding, you need very, very cheap energy. You need something like three, four, five cents per kilowatt hour, uh, reliable and 24 hours a day because you're also paying for extremely expensive machinery and highly yeah. sophisticated machinery. And you need it to run 24 hours a day. You know, if you're going to be paying for that machinery and you're running it 
only when the sun shines and or when the wind blows you're not going to be able to be competing uh, to compete with the miners that are connecting their machines to sources of energy that are running 24 7. Uh, you know they are um running their machines over the, uh, 24 hours a day you're running it let's say 16 hours a day they're making uh, significantly they're making 50 percent more yeah there's no way it's 16 hours a day <laughs> now, by the way it's like maybe yeah. eight hours a day yeah i mean if you add some wind and solar together in some locations yeah you know that, that's true uh, i guess well maybe. i guess i mean it's all like what i see is it's all just these these scams where you know you'll go to a place like texas and you'll cut a deal and you'll say like, okay, we'll give it to you for three cents a kilowatt hour, but you're really parasiting off their natural gas plants and more broadly, you're parasiting off their rate payers. So there's all of this that goes on in the, in the world of electricity. Again, it's so interconnected and it's so government controlled. There's just a, just anyone who's at all free market, anyone should do this, but if, particularly if you're at all free market, just assume that anything involving electricity is just fraudulent in terms of the accounting of it, the discussion of it. Like whenever anyone quotes you any rate, just be aware that this is almost certainly a lie uh, that is designed to manipulate yeah. because it's so hard to calculate the actual cost of things and to make the actual cost of things fair. And we know there's this fundamental unfairness, which is that uncontrollable electricity gets paid for the same as controllable electricity. It's just a crazy yes. thing. We had this oil executive on my podcast recently, and he, he liked the analogy of like, you know, you have two cars and they cost the same and one works a third of the time. Like, that would never happen, right? You would never pay the same for a car that works a third of the time. You probably wouldn't even pay a third as much for it if you couldn't control uh, the time. And you, because buying three of them would not be as good as having one regular car that, that you can control anytime. Yeah. So what happens in practice, and again, like the sun and the wind, it's not a binary thing. It's up and down, right? It's, it's always these gradations. I mean, it can sometimes go to zero, but it's not like it's, it just doesn't at all resemble what a stored source of energy can do because a stored source of energy you can you can deploy or you can release on demand which include which is when you need it but in the exact quantity you need it so solar and wind are intermittent flows they are you don't get to decide when they flow exactly and you don't get to decide on the quantity that's why i'm saying i want to see one of these actors go off grid and do it. I mean, you can say I have batteries to, to buffer things, but then the question is how much do those cost and is it economic? And so in practice, solar and wind, they are parasites on fossil fuels, nuclear and hydro. That's, that's how they actually work. And we just always need to keep in mind that parasitical relationship and never allow them to portray themselves as freestanding until and unless they actually achieve something freestanding, in which case that, that would be great, but that's nowhere near happening. Yeah, you know, I'm not against innovation. If people can go and build that and show and illustrate that it can be done, well, then go ahead and do it. But as it stands, I think a good way a good way of thinking of this um, in an economic terms came to me um, while discussing this issue on Twitter. Somebody was saying, well, wind and solar have the cheapest marginal cost of energy because there's no fuel. So they run at zero, zero, cost, zero yes. marginal cost. And I thought that was... Uh, th th that really set me up for um, <laughs> figuring out the kind of correct economic way of understanding the problem with this, which is that, yeah, there's zero marginal cost when the sun is shining or the wind is blowing. But then when the sun is not shining or the wind is not blowing or you have dust collected on your solar panel, the, co the marginal cost of energy is infinite. Yeah, that's such a great point. That's that's really the key point. It's zero when the fuel is there, but it's infinity when the fuel is not there. And so if you like to have babies survive, uh, premature babies survive, if you want your fridge to run 24-7, if you'd like to be able to do your laundry whenever you want, not that, rather than, you know, um, have to... Uh, look at the weather forecast and uh, read um, all of the reports on wind in order to figure out when would be a good time for you to do your laundry. If you want to live a life where energy is available for you on demand, then the infinite marginal cost of wind and solar means that you need a backup, which is going to provide you with all of your requirements because that at, at the, at the, there are times if, if it's dark and it's not windy, you get zero uh, energy from wind and solar and you get so the cost is infinite so you need full capacity from 
uh, from the backup energy sources. And that's really the issue. Unless you can find a way to make the sun blow at night or make the winds blow, uh, sunshine at night or make the winds blow when it's not windy, you still need a natural gas backup plant. You still need a fossil fuel backup plant. You still need all of these uh, alternatives in order to make it uh, work. And uh, th there's, there's no way around it. I'm curious, what do you think of the energy crisis in China? Now, China doesn't strike me as being uh, extremely on board with all of this uh, green cultish nonsense. Why are they having all these uh, energy crises? Um, yes, that's an interesting one. Actually, I, I just want to refer people. I have a podcast called Power Hour. And if you search Power Hour on YouTube, Richard Toll, T-O-L. So he's a pretty famous climate economist. We had an interesting discussion lately. And we had an argument. He had he had insulted something I said on Twitter about energy prices, so I invited him on so we can discuss it. But he had, I just referenced this because he had a really good discussion of China. He acknowledged, actually, I didn't think he sufficiently acknowledged green policies for Europe's problems, but he did for China's, which is, so I'd, I'd recommend checking that out. But yeah, so you look at China's actually a really powerful illustration of, of two things. So the obvious thing is just a government-controlled economy. And all of the, you know, all of the failings of that and the hazards of that. But the other thing is they have, it shows even when you try to incrementally go green, it can be disastrous. So in their case, what they've done is they haven't committed to, or they haven't implemented yet any absolute emissions uh, reduction. So every year their emissions still go up, but they have these different, what they call emissions intensity targets. So we're going to generate more, you know, GDP per uh, CO2 emission than we did before. So there are gonna be fewer emissions allegedly for more wealth, but you look at how that goes in practice, trying to hit these targets, they end up shutting down a whole bunch of coal, uh, that sh shutting down power plants, you know, having outages and they're deciding for different sectors of the economy, well, is this too emissions intense, right? So they're shutting down things if, oh, it determined if, if it involves too much CO2. And then the other thing is they're, they're dependent on the global economy in different kinds of ways. And in particular, they were dependent on Australia and they had this spat with Australia. The rest of the world is going ESG. So we're under producing coal, oil and gas. And so what happens is China has its own failings. Plus it has this dispute with Australia. Plus it has these green policies. So yeah, they are having massive, massive uh, problems. So they're there. I mean, we're all contributing to it. It's important. These fuel markets are fairly international markets. So when all of us, like when there is a global movement to produce less cost-effective fossil fuel, that starts to affect everyone. For instance, it affected India very, very badly uh, because you know they're 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 dependent on the international market in different ways, and even they have different initiatives to restrict it. So everyone, everyone around the world has some sort of initiative to restrict things. Uh, China is still expanding, but they're expanding less than they would be expanding without these kinds of pressures. And in particular, they're doing these fascistic like shutdowns of, of specific things. So they're also an illustration of, of you know, the green movement uh, destroying energy, even them, because in general, they're doing much more fossil fuel use than other people, but even they are causing a lot of suffering there. But of course, that government isn't particularly concerned about localized suffering among its population. Well, that's interesting and kind of depressing. You'd think they'd, uh, you know, at least the world's workshops would continue to operate while uh, the grids in the rich world fail, but seems not. I think we should also add, you know, it's not just China and the West. I think the real, the really pernicious um, impact of the green uh, climate catastrophist movement is uh, perhaps far more devastating than what's happening in the rest of the, in the rich world is what's been happening for decades in the poor world in particular um, development organizations which have been uh, taken over by this insane cult of um, worshiping the sun and the wind and their uh, energy the, and worshiping them as energy sources and they've tried to get poor countries to uh, as they call it, leapfrog yeah. the fossil fuel phase. You know, just like a lot of African countries, a lot of people in Africa didn't ever get, uh, never, never used landlines, and went went straight from mobile from not having a phone to having mobile phones because mobile phones were just uh, more advanced. This has been a very strong driver of development thinking for the past few decades, 
the idea that we need the developing world not to go down the blind alley of fossil fuels and instead they need to go uh, straight to renewables and uh, this has been enormously devastating because you would have uh, power plants in the middle of uh, very poor countries that are built with for wind or for solar energy and I mean the difference in cost is astronomical you know you can get a modern coal plant or a modern gas plant that offers cheap reliable 24 7 energy and you could put it in a poor city and it would give that city 24 7 electricity but for 10 times the cost <laughs> You can build massive solar panels that require an army of essentially slave labor that has to go around wiping it every day because it's in the middle of the desert and it keeps collecting dust uh, in order to make it work. So essentially you're using manual labor. You're, you're using manual energy. You may as well just have the slave labor um, perform the jobs at home. and It'll be cheaper than just installing all those solar panels. And the cost is much higher and the... Um, of course, these things fall apart and disintegrate and need a lot more maintenance. And it's just amazing. I've, I've not seen this. Um, I've, I've seen uh, many Africans uh, speak about this, but I've not seen a specific uh, detailed study on the economics of this or if somebody has tried to look at the cost of all of these uh, renewable energy projects in the developing world and how how much cheaper it, we could have, uh, you know, how much energy we could have had if we'd uh, just, you know, if we'd taken all these solar plants, <clears throat> excuse me, and replaced them with, uh, with, you know, functional uh, fossil fuel plants. Have you, have you looked into this? Have you seen anything about this? Well, I don't know. So there's a bit of these kinds of schemes that, you know, you're putting in some plant somewhere, but, but really what's happening is restriction and the absence. So it's not like you just have all these wind turbines and solar panels just being built everywhere and it's hugely costly. It's mainly you're not building things that should be built. And this whole sustainable, you know, this whole sustainable development movement, which is really just the anti-development movement, because them, to them, sustainable means low impact. And low impact and development are not compatible because development is to intelligently impact the earth transformatively to meet human needs. So in practice, this goes beyond fossil fuels. There's opposition to hydro, there's opposition to modern agriculture. And what's happened is that the prejudices of anti-human impact Western thinkers are being imposed on these poor places. And this, this unfortunately, is just a truth of life that it's always easier to stop something new than to, than to ban something old. And so that's what's happening with Africa in particular, is they're saying like, yeah, they can't get rid of oil and coal and gas here very quickly in the wealthy world, but it's a lot easier to stop projects, particularly because you have all these dictatorships, and there are all these different funding things, and so you disincentivize them and you tell them, hey, like, we'll give you some money if you don't build this coal plant. And now we're encouraging China. I mean, China was building infrastructure through its Belt and Road thing, which had its own problems. But now they're being now they're saying, oh, we're not going to build any coal plants abroad. We're going to build a ton at home. We're not going to build any abroad. But who does that hurt? That hurts the poorest people. So it's really a you know, specific genocidal thing, but it's really mostly we're destroying the potential versus even we're showering them with welfare. Because the scale of what you would need to do is just so big that nobody's doing it. I mean, there's a story that Lomborg tells in his book, and I, I use in my next book as well, like in Dharna in India, you know, Greenpeace helps fund or promote this quote microgrid and then people use it and just the power wears out immediately and they're like hey connect us to coal like because this just doesn't work at all there's that kind of thing but i don't know of any situation where it's actually they're actually where the leapfrogging is actually attempted on a modern scale what you can see is yeah you give a gift of like some solar panels to a village and some batteries so maybe they can charge a cell phone like okay that could be fine as a charitable thing but unfortunately it's being treated as a replacement for industrializing. And that's the tragedy. They should really be industrializing. Like imagine if China 40 years ago had indulged in this leapfrogging BS, right? No, they're like, we're going to build real infrastructure. And even the cell phones, cell phones are a bad analogy in many ways because cell phones do have many superiorities to landlines. But it's still a problem that in these poor countries, you can't build like wired infrastructure. There's a lot of things that wired infrastructure is better for and they don't have that 
wired infrastructure. So just the idea of, oh, yeah, these poor, there's this image of, oh, I'm so happy this little kid in Africa can talk on a cell phone. It wasn't that great. Like, no, they want or most aspire to having a real world, including real infrastructure, not just cell phones. Yeah, no, I agree entirely. Um, so going back to the uh, Glasgow conference, so um, I don't really follow these things very closely. Can you read, uh, I, I, you, you know, you, you do, unfortunately for you, <laughs> you spend a lot of time sifting through their uh, noise. Can you tell us a little bit about what they decided to do? So I've heard things like $120 trillion uh, as a number being bandied about. And, you know, even though that's dollars, it's still uh, kind of serious money. Trillion, a few hundred trillion dollars is not a joke. What are they going to do with that? And um, I think that, was the, that was the, if, if I'm, we're thinking of the same thing, I think that was the number that Janet Yellen, so our treasury secretary said is necessary to fight climate change. But the, you know, the, the, like the main, the core commitment. So, so first of all, these these conferences, it's the UN. Fortunately, it's non-binding. But you know, two essential things that happen at these conferences are one that countries agree to reduce their own emissions, and then two that wealthy countries agree to give a bunch of what I would consider climate welfare to poor countries. Um, so those are the two categories of things. Let me just quickly say because I don't think I've said it here. You can look more into my work, but I regard it as a fact that climate is not a catastrophe. At least right now, we are safer from climate than ever. So I post a lot. You can see it on energytalkingpoints.com or, or my Substack, uh, just alexepstein.substack.com. Like climate related, so the deaths from climate are at all time low. So we are safer than ever from climate. If you look at damages that you can quantify, damages are basically flat from climate. So it's a very small percentage of our productivity that we spend dealing with climate. So in fact, we are masters of climate. That's the objective state of climate today. The reason people think it's a catastrophe is not science and it's not economics, it's morality. They think it's evil for us to impact the climate. So they think the fact that we've increased the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere from 0.03% to 0.04%, and that has contributed some to the one degree of warming in the last 170 years, that's viewed as immoral. And so it's really a moral catastrophe from that perspective, from the anti-human impact perspective but it's not at all an actual catastrophe for humans. Quite the contrary, we're experiencing a climate renaissance. And that is largely because uh, we have fossil fuel machines to protect us from climate. So they build sturdy infrastructure and they alleviate drought and they give us heating and air conditioning, et cetera. So I just want people to know, because I haven't summarized that, I regard climate mastery as the overwhelming force that determines the livability of climate. And because we're at an all-time high of climate mastery made possible by fossil fuels, we're at an all-time high of climate livability. So I, I just totally reject anyone who's talking about the future of climate. If they don't acknowledge the present climate renaissance, I regard them as just having a corrupt moral way of looking at it or being uh, ing ignorant. Uh, so I will only listen to climate catastrophe predictions from people who acknowledge the current climate renaissance. But say, if guess how many of those people there are who make climate catastrophe predictions that acknowledge the current climate renaissance? Um, approximately zero. Yeah, I have not met one uh, yet. Yeah. So that shows it's a moral issue, right? It's your standard of evaluation. Are you evaluating the climate by how livable it is for humans, in which case it's really good, or are you evaluating it by how unimpacted it is by humans? And if it's the second, yeah, it's a catastrophe or a crisis. So, um, that's that's part of why I regret this is genocidal because they're they're solving a non-problem and, and they're all their solutions will make us more endangered from climate because that means less heating, less air conditioning, less drought relief, et cetera. So the two categories are, yeah, it's nations basically committing to kill their own citizens. That's my summary of net zero. And then they're claiming, oh, we're gonna we're gonna apologize for our sins, so we're gonna fund these poor countries. Well, that's wrong in several respects. One is that we are restricting their development. So it is not a good deal to prevent countries from developing and then giving them a bunch of cash. That does not help them, but that is very, that helps dictators. That does not help citizens. I mean, imagine like when the US was developing, if someone said to us, hey, you get a bunch of cash in today's money, and but you're not gonna develop. Like, no, you need to be productive. That's the fundamental thing. So we're offering that deal. Second thing is we do not owe these countries climate welfare. If you look at, the life expectancy in countries around the world, even the poor countries have benefited tremendously from the superior productive ability of the wealthy fossil fuel countries. So 
we're increasing the life expectancy around the world uh, dramatically. So if you want to talk in terms of externality language, the, the positive externalities have far, far outweighed the negative. So there's not, there should not be this climate guilt. And it's, it's really perverse that it's viewed as, oh, we did an evil thing, the West or the free world. And now you got, now some of the poor countries are saying, okay, let us do an evil thing. No, it's much more, we did a good thing and you should be free to do a good thing. So this, this yeah. idea that we've oppressed people by producing so much value that the world is an unnaturally abundant, safe opportunity filled place, that's just so perverse. And almost nobody challenges that. Almost everyone says, oh yeah, well, of course we should give a hundred billion dollars a year, but no, that's being tied to anti-development incentives and it is unearned and it reinforces this broader idea of climate crisis that's leading to these genocidal policies. The other thing is some of these poor countries, unfortunately, they're advocating that the US and wealthy places go net zero by 2030. So China, uh, a bunch of poorer places had this, this document a couple of weeks ago where they're saying, hey, like we don't agree to go net zero by 2050. I'm like, great, okay, you shouldn't do that. But then they say, oh yeah, you guys gotta go net zero by 2030. Can you imagine just based on what we've talked about, how that would affect the poor world if the wealthy world went net zero in eight years? Like everyone would starve. The idea that it's good for them if we stop using machines in the wealthy world just betrays such a fundamental misunderstanding of how the world actually works and what, what their welfare depends on. Yeah, the idea that, you know, basically let's impoverish the rich people and that'll make the poor people better off well if you if, if your world is focused on if your worldview is all about inequality then i guess this might make sense but of course there's objective uh, reality for what constitutes a better life and having machines and electricity is one of those things um incidentally of course you know you mentioned earlier that it was it's been since the 70s that this um the, the, this kind of hysteria has been uh happening and i i'm just going to briefly say that in my book uh the fiat standard i look at uh, you know the inflation of the 1970s there was massive inflation in the 1970s and i think um researching that book and looking at how the monetary origins of that inflation came about and then the government response to it shows two uh three well two areas in which we saw the same kind of government approach to the issue of inflation the first is food and the other one is energy and it's the same thing you know those two things everybody needs food and energy everybody's consuming them they're essential for life and they're goods that are constantly in a in a very liquid market you know everybody's spending money on food every day and money on energy every day and so when inflation hits those are the things that um, manifest the inflation first and those are the things that hit people's wallets first and those are the things that make people angry first you know you've always uh, your your salary was enough for you to eat and drive your car and then something happens and now your salary is not enough for you to eat and drive your car and that just makes you very vividly angry now obviously um the the same thing to do would be for government to stop the inflationary monetary policy that had caused this but um this is practically never happened in history governments don't once they get go down the road of inflation the only way they can think of fixing any problem is more inflation and so the way that you know we see this right now that uh, as inflation is uh, increasing you hear the government saying don't worry we're going to spend a whole bunch of money and we're going to give you a whole bunch of money and that's going to fix inflation and that also is what happened in the 1970s but I think a very, very interesting lesson, which I learned while researching and writing the fiat standard, which I think is very relevant for today, is how they tried to alleviate and hide the inflation in the 70s. And that, I think, was the, this is why both the um, climate hysteria originated in the 1970s or the anti specifically the anti fossil fuel hysteria originated in the 1970s mainly and also the anti meat hysteria so in the 1970s you had the birth of two very strong types of uh, stupid pseudoscience really where uh, it, it, it's it's just irrational um, cultish ideas of meat is bad for you and um, oil and gas are bad for you and the exact details of why these things are bad for you are a whole bunch of ever-shifting, extremely silly, extremely idiotic um, uh, stories that have been promoted very heavily 
by governments and by government funded universities. And I think the you, you can't escape the conclusion that it was the inflation. And in my book, I have um, I, I've had it, I've added I've, I've mentioned many examples of how the inflation was a direct cause of this. You know, the 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 energy policy of the U.S. government in the 1970s and the Department of Energy was to ma manage and centrally plan energy markets in a way that decreases reliance on fossil fuels. And there was a constant ever-shifting array of reasons of why you should shift away from fossil fuels. First, they're running out. Second, uh, may, they make us dependent on evil uh, foreign uh, governments. Thirdly, they are um, destroying the earth. And, um, you know, we went from the 1970s, they're running out, to in the 1980s when the price crashed, we went to, oh, well, right. actually, okay, huh? There's too much, right? It's, exactly. It's, there's there's too not much. enough and there's too much. The, yeah, it was not enough and then it's too much. But, you know, the constant thing is that we need to get rid of it. And similarly with meat, there was all these stories. Cholesterol is bad for you and animal meat is bad for you and too much protein is bad for you and plant protein is, is good for you. But the common theme is that the essential thing that people naturally want is what reflects inflation very quickly. And the cheap alternatives that governments want to promote is the thing that is extremely inferior. And it is the thing where you can hide the inflation. So if everybody eats soy instead of meat, inflation doesn't look as bad. If everybody eats bugs instead of meat, inflation also doesn't look as bad. And if everybody stays home and doesn't drive and you know um, wears a jacket instead of having central heating and relies on wind and solar, Inflation is also not very bad. And I think this is what we're seeing right now. We're seeing those narratives being pushed in an extremely aggressive way now because inflation is picking up again. And with uh, the, 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 the coronavirus crisis and after the, the aftermath of that and with the enormous amount of money printing, you know, uh, you see that the same people promoting the money printing and the lockdowns are also telling you, oh, look at all this amazing new technology for mixing industrial soy uh, sludge with uh, bug, uh, bugs and um, lab meat uh, in order to give you this amazing protein of the future. Well, it's not an amazing protein for the future. It's just poverty. <laughs> and the same thing is true with energy, you know, um, with all these alternatives, and I think the really scary thing, and this is kind of um, this this is kind of the final chapter of the fiat standard ties all of these things together. The, the book, like the Bitcoin standard, it can go away in some very very uh, long tangential, what might seem like tangential points, getting into food and energy. When you know it's a book about money, what does this have to do with anything? But then if you get to the final chapter, I think what ties all these together is that we're. Uh, you see that this is going to be tied with the central bank digital currencies. And you already hear about how central banks are talking about how we can use central bank digital currencies to fix the climate crisis by preventing people from consuming too much of the things that cause bad climate. And we can, and also, you know, of course, they're going to use it as well for stopping people from eating the meat that is supposedly so harmful for them. So um, you can see it when, if your money is central bank digital currency and it's uh, controlled by the central bank, you can see uh, energy and meat rationing on, coming down the pipeline quite easily. You know, it's not a stretch to say that the same governments that locked you at home because of a virus will one day decide you only get to eat 30 grams of meat per day because you know the climate because cow farts are boiling the oceans and you only get to consume this much petroleum and this much natural gas per day because otherwise you know the oceans will boil and i think this is this is kind of the direction where we're going we're witnessing a strong revival of these insane narratives from the 1970s uh, to tackle the inflation problem today all of this is to lead us to the kind of uh, final conclusion where, you know, I try and end every one of these with the conclusion that Bitcoin fixes everything. And it really does, because if you'd like to eat meat, if you'd like to stay warm in the winter, if you'd like to drive your car, your central bank's digital currency is likely not going to help you. Um, that is go That money is going to essentially be just the loyalty scheme uh, card for your government. And really, it's going to be 
um, Bitcoin. I think it's it, it, it's it gets less and less outlandish every day. The idea that you're going to need Bitcoin to buy meat and uh, fuel. I think we really um, need to consider this as a serious possibility and people need to start thinking about Bitcoin more seriously in this regard, not just as a way to avoid the inflation, but also as a way to avoid the um, insane policies that they're going to implement to try and hide the inflation. Yeah, there's a lot, lot of interesting issues. There. There's one thought is that you look at the common denominator, there are a bunch of common denominators among these things that you're mentioning, but one is definitely the idea that like human freedom is a destructive force that needs to be virtuously corrected by government. And there's always a plausibility of that kind of thing because in a sense, well, human beings can do bad things. And, and like you can't hypothetically rule out, yeah, we could be doing something in the aggregate that was causing some major problem. And you need to take steps to address that. But I only take seriously anyone who talks about problems of human freedom or anything like that, or human beings, if they recognize the fundamental value of human freedom. And so here's where it doesn't happen at all. Like in energy, they're not recognizing, hey, we were free to discover these forms of producing energy cost effectively. And that's what allows us to save premature babies and to alleviate drought and to have affordable food and to be able to take vacations. And enjoy. they don't acknowledge the value uh, of that at all. You take even something like COVID, there's just not an acknowledgement of freedom is so crucial to develop different approaches to treating or preventing this kind of thing. And, and it's crucial to people being able to manage these kinds of risks in the context of the rest. Of, there's a, no value in freedom. So when I see people point to problems and they don't value freedom in addressing those problems, what freedom has done so far and what it can do, it just shows a very skewed orientation. I just think people should be aware of that and always just have in our minds that you know, in a sense, everything good in the world is made possible by the freedom of human beings. So when people are pointing out problems and they're not acknowledging the fundamental value of freedom, they're coming from a very warped uh, perspective. And, and you, you cannot trust those people to do anything good uh, with respect to your life. And if they have a good idea, like if they have a better idea about meat, like they can try to persuade you. But notice they don't try to persuade you. It's like they don't or money or healthcare, like on money, they're not like, hey, we've got this really good way of managing money with this printing press and these computers, you can use it if you want, right? It's like, no, we have legal tender, you have to use it. Or with healthcare, it's not like, oh, we've got this great Obamacare idea. Why don't everyone who agrees with this, like Paul Krugman, like you can all get together and you can join this voluntarily and the rest of you can be free. No, right, it's, where it's all imposed on us. So there's no separation of, of state and economics. And there really just should be in all of these um, areas. It's just, it's just another perspective where it's Absolutely. a very warped orientation that doesn't value human freedom. And those of us who do value human freedom should just always look at the world as freedom made this possible. And then I would also add fossil fuels made this possible. Anyone who doesn't acknowledge how good the world is because of those things cannot be trusted to advise on policies for the future. Absolutely. Point. One one particularly extremely scary part of this is the way that Bill Gates has taken to talking to us like he's a school headmaster, just informing <laughs> us of the decisions like of what's the meat, going to happen. The meat thing he said is crazy. Yeah, the, he's just, like, he just oh, gets on get, TV. You, you have he... to eat this and you'll get used to it. My girlfriend had the best response to this, which is, which is like, it's not my job to get used to food. It's food's job to get used to me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. But it's amazing. It's, it's it, you know what's 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 so fascinating about it is it, he doesn't even say you have to eat this. He just says you're going to eat this. We're gonna eat this, and we're gonna do that. And and I remember you know when 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 the when the uh, corona hysteria crisis erupted, how he just went on TV and he said there's no return to normalcy until we've vaccinated the whole world's population. And it's just he 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 issues those edicts as if he really is a school headmaster informing children you know we, this is what you're going to be eating today this is how you this is when you can take your lunch break and this is how you're going to be dressed in school it's amazing and it's, it, and, and it's the same thing with energy you know he's telling us about all these massive projects that he's going to be making billions out of where he, out of the kindness of his heart he's going to help us transition away from the energy sources that work for us um, and happen to make billions out of it. And similarly with food, you know, he's uh, he happens to be he he's just become the biggest single landowner in the U.S. And he's planting all of these disgusting crops that he wants to feed to the entire planet. 
coincidentally and conveniently enough, the same things that he argues will save the planet from uh, cow farts. How utterly convenient. Thank God for Bitcoin. All right. Um, Peter has got some questions for you. So by the way, I just have, I have 10 minutes. I'm happy to answer anything, but I have, I have a okay, meeting sure. nine minutes now. So oh, yeah, I, I'll yeah. try to answer very quickly. All right, go ahead. Whatever Peter. anyone wants to ask. Okay, my question was, uh, what's causing the gas crisis in Europe at the moment? Um, so just highly recommend that website, energytalkingpoints.com, because I have that. But the, so the fundamental thing is the like years of restriction on the ability to produce and transport uh, not only natural gas, but, uh, but coal. So that's the, I mean, the, we had this basic assurance that Europe followed, that the US to some extent followed, which is we're not gonna need as much fossil fuel in the future. So there've been all these different restrictions. And what that did is when you had a rise in demand, which I think was fairly predictable, people said it was unpredictable, you did not have the ability to supply and transport. So that's, that's the quick answer, but I have a lot of details on that website. Fantastic. Um, Stefano has a question for you. Yes. Um, hello, Alex. Thank you. This Hi. was very interesting. Um, so two quick questions. The first one is that 97% of scientists consensus number that it's often uh -huh. thrown out to shut down a debate. Can you right. tell us a little bit whether there is any validity and where it comes from? Yeah. Um, and then the second question, if you if you have time, um, do you know anything about hydrogen based hydrogen hydrogen based power storage? Um, I've heard yes. something about recently and I, I, it seems that it can actually help. Um, I'm curious to know what you think about that. Okay, sure. So yeah, the 97%, there's a lot wrong with it, but the basic thing is it's in philosophy, it's an equivocation. So what mm -hmm. they're doing is they're taking the fact that most climate scientists agree that we have some impact on climates, that's where 97% comes, and they're taking that to mean agreement with catastrophic impact on climate, mm -hmm. which surveys don't show. And then even beyond that, they're further equating that with eliminate fossil fuels, which doesn't follow because the benefits of fossil fuels, even mm -hmm. if they have catastrophic side effects, the benefits to lose could be apocalyptic. And then they equate that with mandating solar and wind in particular. Right. So okay. that's that you're right that it's designed to shut down debate, but it's this deliberately vague thing like, oh, 97% agree with whatever the hell I say. That's what it amounts to. So that's how they're doing that. So, I mean, hydrogen, like this has been around a while. I mean, the thing with hydrogen is it's, it's very implausible as a globally scalable source of energy storage in the near future. So there's been no, the, the key with this is the recent develops in hydrogen are almost all rhetorical, not economic. So mm -hmm. they've been developed rhetorically because people are noticing, oh yeah, solar and wind don't work very well. And we're burning trees, but that's getting us in trouble to meet our renewable mandates. So let's have hydrogen. And they have these arbitrary net zero schemes. And so they need to make up things like, oh, let's have a hydrogen powered plane and a hydrogen powered mm -hmm. ship and stuff. But these are not market phenomena. They are rhetorical phenomena coming from this arbitrary net zero target. That's okay. a short version of that. Thank you, Alex. Yeah, I think mine will be pretty easy. Are there any relatable references uh, for those that bring up um, air quality or temperature issues with regard to pollution um, and emissions that either I could reference myself or just bring up for others to understand easier. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned actually, I like you said my book, so False of Future. Uh, unfortunately, that's by far the best source and that doesn't come out until next year. Um, Moral Case has a little bit and Energy Talking Points has some on this, but the, the key thing is that um, pollution standards should vary based on wealth and based on the specific location. So the, the, the variables you're mentioning are very important. So there's population density, there's uh, you know, things like the Los Angeles uh, Valley, you know, the valley in LA is different, San Fernando Valley in the LA area is very different from say Nebraska in terms of uh, proclivity to air quality issues. And so the key thing is you do you need standards that vary based on the wealth and specific circumstances uh, of the area. And, and the problem is that people have this idea of eliminating emissions at all costs. And that's wrong both because at certain levels, like regular pollution emissions are benign, uh, they're not harmful. And the, but the other thing is, even if there is some harm to them, that harm is often far smaller than the harm that would be done by restricting them. So that, that's, right. the, that's the high level. But I have the most detailed discussion of this. Unfortunately, in a book, you can't get. get. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, Daniel, you want to ask one more question? Yeah, you, you kind of touched on it before, so I'll pivot my question very quickly. Alex, uh, great work. We saw the clip of you uh, giving an interview at the, uh, the COP26 conference. I do not know how you stay so calm. So how, like, who, what, what, what point over the weekend, over that conference, whatever it was, what triggered you the most or who triggered you the most? Oh, I thought you were going to ask how to stay calm. Are you going to know what makes you not calm? <laughs> you could, yeah, that, that too. <laughs> The key to being calm is recognizing that there's a camera on you. I mean, I have a pretty calm personality, but the fail safe is knowing that there's a camera. Like you really have to take that seriously. You have to know what the camera looks like. Not that you want to be self-conscious about it, but you just have to be aware. The person, I mean, save it and look at him. He's very cool. Uh, I mean, I haven't seen him lose control. Maybe it happens, but like, that's a very powerful thing to be, to be seen as like you're calm and you have the answers versus getting agitated. Now you can get emotional, but it still has to be a basic position of calm because in a debate, like the person who's losing their cool is losing, like they come across as losing the debate. So you have to have that uh, awareness. I mean, what upsets me the most, I mean, the, the thing that kind of concretely upset me the most, I'm not saying this is the worst aspect, but the specific the specific commitments to get rid of coal really bother me because they're, and, and particularly some of the more, the better energy thinkers, like um, if he hears this, I'm sure he'll get annoyed, but Roger Pilkey Jr. is a really smart guy who's kind of reasonable on a lot of climate issues and he's good on like climate disaster damages aren't going up, but he's very in favor of like, hey, let's have these commitments to abolish coal plants. And I just think that is indefensible. If you look at like coal is such a special source of energy, the leading source of electricity in the world. And it's particularly good for poor countries because it's very transportable. It's much easier to transport than natural gas. So you look at places like China and India, like they'd have no chance of industrializing without this. And much of Africa really needs coal. So it just really upsets me that that, that particular area of thoughtlessness most hurts the poorest countries in the world. And people are just saying it because it's so easy to say, oh, coal is black. I don't like that. Right. And, and there's no recognition of how vital this is and also how cleanly you can burn it uh, today. Yeah, and it's uh, it, it's much cleaner than the alternative, which is poverty, darkness and yeah, or even biomass, light. indoor biomass, which is you know, or exactly like, you know, yeah, or no burning energy. biomass. Indoors. Yeah, but no yeah, energy exactly. is dirtier than no energy. That's that's a great um, that would be a great way to end. But there's one question I got to get you. If you could okay. just give us one minute about your next book, I should have asked you this earlier. Uh, How is well, what's new in your next book? Well, I hope I hope you get I hope you get to read it. I don't know. If you, um, yes, but, uh, you did give me the early draft, and I will write you a blurb. Yeah. Um, so the um, yeah. What, so it talks about this at the very beginning of it, but I think the the key to it is so the title is Fossil Future. And it's really a systematic look at the future of energy. Moral Case for Fossil Fuels had some of that, but I think this is really the full guide to thinking about the future of energy over the next several generations. And then I would say the software that I'm operating with in terms of the framework of the book, the understanding of how positively to think about energy and the wrong way of thinking about energy is much more powerful now and much more explicit. So I think it'll really teach readers a lot about how to think about energy and also how the other thinking how the conventional way of thinking about energy that most of us pick up is very, very warped and ultimately anti-human. The other thing is just because I've had, I had, I wrote the first one in about six months. This one took me three years knowing a lot more than I used to. So the, also the comprehensiveness is on a totally different level. It, it addresses basically every aspect of the issue that is important. And the reason I thought this is necessary is because this is one of the most important issues in the world. And I do think almost everyone is thinking about it incorrectly. So it's twice as long, you know, it, it's really like, this is my best shot at creating energy clarity in a world that desperately needs it. So it's, it's a difference in kind from that first book. Absolutely. I've started reading it and I tell you, I very strongly recommend it and I uh, urge everybody to pick it up in February when it comes out. Alex, thank you so much for your time. This has been yeah, always, always a pleasure. Always. Someday we're going to meet in person. I know, absolutely. Well, you know, they don't ban flights and all the technologies that we need for that. <laughs> all right, have a good day. Thanks, Take everyone. Care. Take care. Yes.